Hello, welcome and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. This is one of your hosts, Kaitel, and as always, I'm joined virtually here in LA by my co-host Joe from back in our hometown of London. We also have a special guest on today's show who, as somewhat of a legacy player and coach themselves, has genuinely spent a lifetime in and around the professional game. We're going to be chatting about their journey from prodigy to player to coach and manager, as well as hearing a little bit about our guest's new role as first team coach at Bristol Rovers. We welcome Kevin Bond to the United Mates Football Podcast. Kevin, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. How are you doing, mate? I'm very well, thank you. My pleasure to uh, to join you. Yeah, our absolute pleasure, as I, as I said, to have you with us. Really looking forward to chatting about, as I had mentioned as well, a, a lifetime in and around football. Joe, usually this is the part where I try to make some sort of joke at Spurs' expense. Of course, that's your team. And I think at the minute that wouldn't actually be too difficult, given that Recently, you lost, what was it, 3 0 to, to Palace the other day. So, as Kevin's here, I'm thinking maybe it's not the best idea. So, I'd rather not get ganged up on. So, Tottenham's embarrassing 3 0 defeat aside to local rivals. Joe, how have you been? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, the, the Spurs game was a bit unfortunate on the weekend, but you know, we, we've, we've had a decent enough start. Hopefully, got a nice easy game against Chelsea on the weekend to sort it out. So, I'm <laughs> sure we'll, we'll get back to winning ways. But, um, yeah, as um, as Kaitel said, Kevin, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And um, when we interview guests on this podcast, we always start with an icebreaker question. So we we tend to find out something about the, our, our guest and then we ask them about it. So um, we understand, Kevin, that your dad, when you when you were a bit younger, opened a sweet shop in Torquay, I believe, called Bondi's Tuck Shop. Is that true? <laughs> did that happen? Uh, he, he did. He did, actually, um, along with a... A friend of his at the time. Um, he spent he spent a couple of years at Torquay at the latter end of his career. He, 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 I think he spent sixteen years prior to that at West Ham, and then he um, <clears throat> went down to play for a guy called Frank O'Farrell, who had been at West Ham and was um, um, well renowned for his coaching abilities. And he persuaded my dad to go down there, and he and he had uh, two couple of years, maybe a little bit more. And really loved it. I mean, it was, I, I was really, really, a, you know, a top in them days. But um, I can remember it being, a, you know, a fabulous. There was like palm trees on the beach. It was like heaven. Having come from the East End of London, I remember it being a fabulous place. And uh, enjoyed it very much. But it, he, um, if you can believe it, uh, when I say commute, he didn't commute every day. He used to go down for matches in them days. So he trained at West Ham Monday until Friday. And in them days, believe it or not, it used to take, although it can do now with the traffic, but it used to take him six hours to get down to Torquay and he used to go down on a Friday night, play the game, then come home again. And um, he did that for the period of time he was there and made some good friends down there and ended up opening a sweet shop, which I can I can remember. Uh, and you, as you rightly pointed out, called Bondi's Tuck Shop. Fantastic. But given that your dad opened a sweet shop, what we want to know, Kevin, is what was your favourite childhood sweets? But we'll give you some time to think about it. I'll just say I'm just going to go with cherry drop, cherry drops, even quite like them. I, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have one in particular, but I, back in them days, you used to go into a sweet shop, and they would have, if you're going to, they would have this jar, they would have this jar, and there would be fifteen or twenty of these jars at the back of the sweet shop. And you'd go and say, I'd have, I'll have some of them and I'd have some of them. And I'd, so, and then you'd fill up your bag full of all sorts of lemon sherbets and all them sort of things, just loads of them. And it, you know, it was a real treat. Um, completely different to how it is today. The shopkeeper used to stick his hand in the jar and pull them all out and put them in your bag and, um, which we didn't really worry about. And it was that, that, that was it really. So that was, um, it it was the it was the jars of sweets that we used to mix up and stick them in a paper bag that used to twirl around and away you'd go. Was, oh, um, bit of a pick and mix situation. But bit Kai, of a pick and mix situation. Yeah. <laughs> but Kai, what about you? Quickly before we get onto the serious stuff, what what would you go for? Well, yeah, no, I was thinking about the the pick and mix too. I remember we had a mate who was a pick and mix thief. He shall remain nameless. Um, but um, uh, I think my favourite sweet. Um, might be a drumstick from childhood at least. They used to come attached to like the Beano or the Dandy sometimes. And I think it's supposed to be like a rhubarb and custard kind of chewy combo. Um, definitely out here, you don't find them. So that's that's a pretty nostalgic one for me. But I guess 
speaking of nostalgia and, and childhood, we'll take it away from sweets. We'll take it back to football. And I referenced at the top of the show, um, Kevin, but as, as the son of a footballer and a manager, you, you were surrounded by the beautiful game at the highest level from a very young age. Your dad, John, played well over 300 times for West Ham. He would go on to yeah. manage clubs like Bournemouth, Norwich and Man City during your youth and into your adulthood, um, as well as managing other teams too. But taking it right back to the origin, what are your really early memories uh, when it comes to football? Were you sort of the one writing your own footballing narrative? as a kid or did you perhaps more sort of find yourself being led down a path that had been set out for you by your dad? Um, I suppose in the very, very early years, um, my, my father lived, bought a house when he joined West Ham and we lived maybe 400 yards. It was a, a, like a terraced house that was maybe 400 yards from Upton Park. And that was where we lived. So um, it was literally just around the corner and that was where we stayed until I was about 13 years of age when we moved down to Bournemouth so um, as a very youngster I used to go to uh, occasionally used to go to West Ham's training ground which in them days used to be Chadwell Heath but I used to go to a lot of the games uh, Upton Park which as I say was just around the corner and as a seven-year-old uh, I, I experienced the FA Cup final that West Ham and my father played in against Preston North End, which they were fortunate enough to win. And, and I went to that game and I could, I could remember the game. I could remember the, I could remember the, uh, the, it's not the ceremony, the reception that all the players got on the Sunday morning when they drove through West Ham and um, around the area in, the, in a coach, open top coach. There was just thousands upon thousands upon thousands and, and even down our street where we lived, they got out all the regalia and welcomed my dad back. And I, so it was a big thing. It was the first real trophy, major trophy that West Ham had won, I believe. Um, so that was a big thing, certainly a big thing for my father, uh, who was in his early 30s at that stage. So I suppose them early years was what really got me if you know, hooked, if I needed getting hooked uh, in football. Well, um, I guess moving on to the start of your professional career, it's still, I guess, linked to your dad in some ways. I know you started as a trainee at Bournemouth and then yeah. we go on to Norwich. And well, obviously your dad, well, he'd been at Bournemouth, moved to Norwich. So from your perspective, being the son of the manager, did was, was that something that was difficult for you or did were you kind of treated one, once you were at the club just like everyone else? No, <clears throat> I was always treated just like everybody else, but... Um, it was it was difficult for me, just very brief. It was difficult for me at the start because as a fifteen year old leaving school, which you, you could leave school at fifteen back in them days. So um, my father gave me an apprenticeship at Bournemouth, which was a three year apprenticeship, and I you know I was very very I was a very late developer. So I was um, and you know as a professional footballer, I was something like without exaggeration, five foot five and eight and a half stone. I was very small, very slight, very weak. And not very many people would have given me a chance of making it as a professional footballer. I didn't think that I had one. My father, who, you know, was the manager, gave me a chance. He, he, he didn't blindly give me a chance just because he could. He genuinely saw something in me. I was a, a, one or two attributes. I was always a decent passer of the ball and I could read the game reasonably well but I think everyone thought that I had too much to you know all of his coaches and all the people at the club and all of the they all thought that I had too much to do and probably wouldn't make it um my, my father to his eternal credit gave me a chance where I you know, honestly wouldn't have got a chance from anybody else and when I started to grow in my late teens and started to develop I got better and um and ended up carving a career career out uh, for myself so while I'm very thankful for me I'm probably more grateful and thankful for my father because it justified the faith that he showed in me when I was very young yeah I mean your career sort of speaks for itself but it is quite a nice story that um fate sort of worked out like that like you mentioned yeah if uh, if it hadn't have been your dad you might not have ever had the opportunity but again like I said to go on to to play for you know Man City and again that yeah. was with your dad um, you'd also make a lot of appearances uh, for Southampton and, and Bournemouth. So a great career, but actually a spell that I 
wanted to focus on was uh, your brief time over here on the west coast of the states with the Seattle Sounders playing in the the NASL at the time. Um, you made the move when you're in your early 20s, Kevin, and I think these days, whilst the MLS, as it you know you would call it now, is improving, I think the general opinion is still that there's a bit it's a bit of a retirement league for the top players. So my question is, how did the move come about? And in your mind at the time, what was sort of behind the decision to join the Sounders? What did it look like for you in terms of a, a, a step in your career? When I, um, when I, when I moved to, um, I, I knew I was sort of, I had connections to Seattle. I knew people who played in Seattle. I mean, Harry Redknapp had played in Seattle prior to, uh, to me going out there. I had a very good, I still have a very good friend of mine called John Ryan who played with me at Norwich. We went out there and I've been out to Seattle on holiday. I've got to know the players at Seattle. I knew Alan Hinton, who was the manager at Derby County player. So I knew the people at, at the football club and I'd been out there on holiday the previous year. And I was going, I, 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 I was going to leave Norwich City one way or another come the end of the summer. My father had left the club and I think it would probably be best for everybody at the club if I left also. But it was going to be difficult for me to move from Norwich to Manchester City it got a little bit political, really. So, um, some somebody enabled me to go to Seattle um, for the summer, which was from March till the end of the season, which was maybe September. And then when I went out there, I'd, I'd already tied up a deal that at the end of the season I would go back to Manchester City. So, um, it I probably wouldn't, with all due respect to the NASL, and I and I loved every minute of it. I thought it was fabulous. I probably at that stage wouldn't have wanted to leave England for good, but I, leaving England for um, bearing in mind most of the time I was there was the close season in England anyway. Leaving there for a period of time, knowing full well at the end of that American season I was going back to Manchester City, um, you know, was a was a no brainer for me. Um, and in the event, I went there, got to see lots of America, got to got to uh, play some fantastic stadiums in some fantastic cities against some wonderful players. And it's one of the best experiences that I've ever had in football. Or one of the best experiences I've had full stop. Yeah, it's pretty cool that you're able to fit an experience that a lot of English players will never have had the opportunity to, to have themselves into sort of a period while you were still growing your own career back home and you managed to sort of fit, make it all work around yeah around each yeah. other but we we try to do our our research as best as best as we can and something sort of was flagged up to me as i was looking at your time in seattle is your goal scoring record for the for the club <laughs> pretty pretty impressive is that sort of a reflection on the standard of the league or were you playing in a different position because last time i checked you were a center back yeah i I'd, um before i left actually the season i left uh seattle i'd had a um a particularly a fortuitous, I suppose you would say, a decent season in, in, in England with Norwich and I scored 11 goals in, um, in what today is the Premier League um, and I was playing fullback in them days. So that was, I did take the penalties, maybe five of those were penalties, but nevertheless, um, you know, to get 11 goals at that level for Norwich City was, a, was something I was really, really proud of. Um, so I used to obviously used to like getting forward and getting involved in attacking play as much as I could, um, which I was encouraged to do when I got to Seattle. And um, I, I, I don't know, I, I end up, I can't remember now, I got 15 or 16, something like that, goals at the end of the season. I can't remember, but it was, it was, you know, the way the way the game was played, the way we was playing, the way I was encouraged to get forward. And it was, um, it, I must say, an absolutely wonderful experience. It, I know, um, I know the NA, American soccer. I know has been sort of through its peaks and troughs and what have you. But during the time that I was get, I was there, uh, Seattle, which I think has always been a well supported club, was getting twenty five and thirty thousand people um, at the Kingdome, which it was then, and it was just a fantastic experience. I absolutely loved it. It sounds like an absolutely fantastic experience and a cool thing to have done before, obviously, the move to Man City. But um, yep. obviously, we've spoken a little about your playing career, but we want to move on to talk about your coaching career a bit now. So I know that yep. um, you had a spell managing Stafford Rangers, then you'd coach yep. Wrexham and Altrincham and places like that. But I guess one of the a, a big job you've got was under the late Alan Bull at Portsmouth, which I guess would yep. be 
your first spell um, coaching at the club. Um, and I know during that season, the club was suffering from a lot of um, financial problems. It was about a year or so before Milan Mandarit bought them. So it was a tough time. Yeah. As, a, yeah. as, as a sort of coach making his way in the game at the time, did, did those off the field problems make your job as a coach harder or were you able to kind of distance yourself from all of that? Well, um, my, my, in truth, my first experience with Alan and, and my first real experience in coaching was um, w- was at Manchester City. I, I'd, I'd finished playing. I'd finished playing football very briefly. I'd finished playing football. I was, I was coming to the end of my football career, and I actually had a um, what amounted to a transport cafe. It's a long story how I got involved. I was running a transport cafe in Southampton along with playing really at the back end of my career at Exeter. And, you know, I d- didn't know what the future held for me, although I would have loved to got involved in football. Anyway, Alan Borley was a manager of Manchester City then, who I knew because I played for him at, at, uh, at Exeter for a short while and I, I knew him anyway through, through football. He asked me if I'd go and be his coach at Manchester City. Um, and obviously I jumped at the chance a club I played for. So I went there in the summer and joined as reserve team coach. Alan, bless his heart, um, lost his job after three matches. Um, a couple of weeks later, they employ- employed Steve Koppel. Um, Steve Koppel decided after about six weeks that the job wasn't for him. So he left. Um, they gave the job to Phil Neal, who was Steve Koppel's assistant on a temporary basis. I think he lasted maybe three or four weeks. Then they went back to Tony Book, who was a club legend at Manchester City. And then finally, they gave the job to Frank Clark. I'd had five managers and we wasn't into October. And I, that was my first job in football. Frank Clark sacked me in the summer. And that was my introduction to football. And I thought, wow. And I, I would never, never forget the secretary at, um, at Manchester City, a guy by the name of Bernard Halford, who passed away, sadly, uh, only recently. Uh, and a, a wonderful man who's a bit of a legend at uh, Manchester City said to me after I'd left the club and I, then I got my job at Stafford Rangers, which you mentioned earlier on, he said to me, Kevin, to be in football and to stay in football, you, you, you've got to have the skin of a rhino and the heart of a lion. And it stayed with me for all these years. And he is so right. I mean, it is such a, um, it, it is such a game that is full of highs and lows that um, you, you, ne- you never quite know where you are. So my, introduction was a real baptism of fire um but but luckily i alan ball lost his job and then and then he got the manager's job at um at portsmouth as you mentioned um a few months later and asked me to go down there and join him which was fantastic because my, i kept my house in southampton so i went back home again and and i was back involved again but it it, it is a very um it is a very testing game kevin after Pompey, you would join West Ham, but as a scout rather than yeah. coach, um, which is a bit of a twist on uh, on your experience up until then. Um, and then you would have been, uh, I guess, in the Bournemouth Academy back in the day while Harry Redknapp yeah. was a senior pro at the club. And then you also played for Harry later on at Bournemouth when yes. he was a manager. But this is, I guess, at West Ham now that you're his scout, the first time that you sort of, the first of many times that you would have been part of his backroom stuff. So where does that trust in you from Harry come from? What was the catalyst for your close working relationship? I, I'd, I'd, I'd know. You see, Harry Harry played for West Ham, at, and he would he would have been a young player when my father was a senior player in the sixties at West Ham. So uh, I've actually known I, I've actually known Harry. I, I must say, sort of virtually all my life as a very very young boy, uh, I knew him um, and and Sandra. So there was always a connection there for with him. He asked me, as you say, to go and play for him at the back end of my career when he was manager of Bournemouth and I was living in Southampton. And we'd always sort of stayed in touch and always we have got on very well. Uh, and he had an opportunity to um, to give me a job when I needed a job, when I was out of work, um, as you say, as a European scout at West Ham, which was a great, you know, it wasn't ultimately what I wanted to do, but it was a great learning curve for me, a great experience going all over Europe watching players was was good for me, really good for me. And Harry was kind enough to uh, give, give me a chance, really. Um, and then after he left West Ham and he got the Portsmouth job uh, a short while later, 
he asked me to go down there and, and join him and Jim Smith, who was his assistant as a coach, and probably one of the most enjoyable experiences um, as a coach uh, on that side of the game that I've ever had. The, the first year we was at Portsmouth when um, Harry got them up, and it was um, it was a wonderful time, really wonderful time. Well, on that spell with uh, Portsmouth that came after West Ham, when you again would all go with uh, with Harry over there. And you mentioned the success. This is, you know, you're returning to, to Fratton Park um, for, well, the first time you're returning, but this is your second second spell there in your yeah. coaching career. Things are pretty different. You mentioned the, the promotion versus, you know, the club sort of just about surviving relegation um, at, at the back end of uh, your first spell there yeah, from uh, the old Division One of the championship as it would be now. Just what changed in that time? Was it a lot of what you and, and Harry were able to, to bring in and the rest of the backroom staff had the playing staff improved that just that much in the time, in the short sort of time that had passed. I think, I think there, there was, um, obviously man, Milan Mandrick was in charge. He decided that he wanted to have a, a, a real go in, employed Harry, Harry, um, Harry worked really hard in the summer and, and changed pretty much the entire team. You know, I could, I could go through the pretty much, he changed the entire team, which is a big risk, really, trying to get a whole new group of players to knit, knit together in, in one pre-season is a hard thing to do. But but he did, you know, that we hit the ground running. I, I remember just before the first game of the season, which was Notts Forest, literally a couple of days before he signed Paul Merson, um, who was just a fantastic player. But you, you just, I suppose, in the back of your mind, you wondered... How much does Paul Merson really want to do it, given that he'd been at Arsenal and the career that he's had? Does he really want to do it still? That would probably be the, the question. Anyway, Harry brought him down. And I, and I think Paul will tell you now that, that you know, his time at Portsmouth was um, one of the greatest experiences he had in his entire football career. It was fantastic. So he come down here and um, was absolutely wonderful for us, was, you know, the catalyst, really along with, you know, loads and loads of other signings that were just made the difference. So I think, I think it was that really, Harry had to change the squad. They, they, they were languishing really, um, took a chance, signed a lot of new players uh, and we pretty much hit the ground running and ended up having a fabulous season. Yeah, I mean, you had a, you had a couple of fabulous seasons, to be honest, and um, came out to the Premier League and did really well too. But then obviously in 2004, sort of at the end of the year, there'd be the, well, I suppose it was a very controversial move in very many, in very many ways where Redknapp, yourself, and was Joe Jordan along with you? Then? No, Joe, Joe didn't. Joe was with us at Portsmouth, but Joe didn't, Joe didn't go to Southampton. Oh, okay. he, never, he never left. Okay, well, anyway, Joe Jordan aside, obviously the move happened to Southampton, which obviously Harry Redknapp got a lot of stick for. But from, yeah. from where you were at, given you'd obviously played for Southampton, you mentioned earlier you were living in Southampton, you had a connection to the area was it was it a move you welcomed or was it a, was it even for you a slightly difficult decision to make given all the success you'd had with Harry at Portsmouth I think we'd have you know I think Harry would have in an ideal world would probably have preferred to have you know things were going well at, at Portsmouth and he'd preferred to have stayed but the, the, the chairman had brought in a director of football and I think and I think Harry felt that He'd been somewhat undermined and he was thinking that things weren't going to be quite the same as they were. I didn't like the way that things were working out. And I think he must have had a, you know, somewhere along the line, he must have had a phone call from the from the chairman, Rupert Lowe. At, um, I mean, maybe that had happened after he left, but it, he, he wasn't happy with how things were going at, at Portsmouth. Decided he had enough, didn't, you know, say so left. And then he got the opportunity to go to um, Southampton. From my point of view, um, you know, with me being so closely linked with Harry, I, there was no way I was going to be able to stay at Portsmouth. I had no future there. So um, there was no question for me that um, I, I would have to be leaving Portsmouth. And, and if Harry went to Southampton and decided he wanted to take me, then I'd have been delighted as I was to have gone. Obviously, it was a club I played for. So, I mean, there is a very, very big rivalry down here, more, more than maybe some people would recognise between Portsmouth and Southampton. And, and, uh, and obviously I'd had a foot in both camps in the end, which, you know, might, might upset, upset both sides, really. And it, so in the end, I couldn't win for losing. But, um, you know, 
I have to work, so I needed to work. Harry had the opportunity and wanted to take me, so I was absolutely delighted to go there with him. And unfortunately, we couldn't quite, they were in a difficult position and we couldn't quite turn it around as we wanted to, took it to the last game of the season. And I thought before the last game of the season, I thought we'd get there and I thought we'd do it, but things just sort of contrived against us. And unfortunately, it, it turned out disappointing for us. So, um, so we... So we went back to Portsmouth again. <laughs> yeah, you, you certainly did. This time uh, you'd be assistant manager at Portsmouth. And I think from there you would go on to be the late Glenn Roder's assistant at Newcastle yeah. United. Um, and then, of course, you would manage Bournemouth, which we will talk a bit more about soon. But sticking with the assistant manager route for, for the minute, you would um, rejoin Harry as his assistant at, uh, at Tottenham. And this was during... A really successful time uh, for you guys and for the club because of course as an Arsenal fan it pains me to, to have to remember this but of course you did famously qualify for the Champions League in 2010 yep. so I guess I'm curious to know beyond the players having to make the step up to the the highest level of club football the Champions League that following season did did you find that you and the rest of the coaching staff also felt like you sort of needed to take your games to the next level, so to speak? Like, just how intense was that 2010-11 um, season in the Champions League for, for you and for the club? Well, it, it, it certainly, you know, the, the moment you walk into Tottenham Hotspur and you see the stadium at White Hart Lane and, and everything that goes with it and the quality of the player, you know, you, with all due respect to wherever I'd been to before, you, you know, immediately recognise that this is a, you know, a big step up, not just a step up, but a big step up. But they were, they, you know, weren't doing. They hadn't started the season great, and people weren't in good form. Um, Harry did a great job, turned it around, you know, immediately. Really made them feel good about themselves. Got players playing in what he believed there was their proper positions, and put tried to put square pegs in square holes. Got a few decent results, and got. And, and got them going again. In, you know, his man management skills were fantastic, got the best out of the players, didn't complicate it for them, um, give them a lot of, give them enough guidance, but didn't overcomplicate it. And it was, you know, what, what we did from a coaching or training point of view wasn't really, I must be honest, wasn't really any different to what we'd done anywhere else. Um, but it was certainly, you could certainly tell that the players, um, you know, some of the players, most of the players, the Luka Modric, the Gareth Bales, they're going to just reel them off, Van der Vaart and all these. They were fantastic players, fantastic professionals, fantastic guys. And it was, uh, you know, for me, just an absolute privilege to, um, to be there and work with them every day. Well, I'm glad you say that. Obviously, I'm, I'm a Spurs fan. I was lucky enough to be a season ticket holder during um, your time at the club and Harry's time. Yeah, at the club. yeah they were got so many great memories from watching um, those teams. But uh, you just mentioned some of the names I was going to say. I mean, you you coached the likes of Modric, Bale, Ledley King, Van der Vaart. Even um, I guess towards the end, of young Harry Kane was sort of yeah, getting, was, yeah, yeah. I remember that Europa League season and stuff like that. But um. On, look, all these all these players were fantastic. Literally, some of the the best players to have played football in recent years. But on the training ground at Spurs Lodge, were there any players that impressed you the most? And if so, why? Um, the, the Ledley, Ledley King impressed me, but Ledley King didn't didn't impress me on the training ground because you never saw Ledley King <laughs> on the training ground. Ledley King used to Ledley King would roll up on a Friday morning when we'd have a we'd have a light session the day before a game and that was what he would do. He'd be inside in the gym or, or in the swimming pool because of his knee, he couldn't train, he couldn't train. So he never, and um, I must say, um, without fear of, of, of exaggeration, I'd been at the club for 18 months and Ledley was playing, you know, regularly then. I'd been at the club for 18 months and before I see him make a mistake in a game. I never saw him make a mistake. He was a fantastic player. He read the game. He was, even though he got an injury, he glided across the ground. He made it look so easy. He was a, and a lovely man. He was just a fantastic player. I would, you know, I knew he was a good player, obviously, before I got there, but I didn't realise. But there was, there was numerous players that would fall into that category. Honestly, numerous. Let, um, Luka Modric, who, 
the difficulty for Luca was when we first got there that they weren't sure what his best position was. He would play off the left hand side because weren't sure whether he could play centrally because he wasn't the biggest. And uh, Harry wanted to play some type of four four two, which meant he'd only have two midfield players. Didn't anyway. After a very short period of time, Harry put him centrally and played him alongside whoever it was, Wilson Palacios or whoever in there. And you know. You know, the rest is bloody history. He was just amazing. And Gareth Bale, who had a difficult start at Tottenham, they couldn't win with him in the team and it became a bit of a thing. Wasn't it? Was he a left back? Was he a left winger? And, you know, was given, I suppose, to, he had the shackles taken off of him and he was given the freedom to express himself and just become awesome you know unstoppable for a period of time when we was there so and there, and there and there are you know not just them because they're the household name but there was numerous players Ben Warakota who was um took a lot of criticism as defensively when when we'd got there and prior to us getting there who, who I thought after a sh very short period of time watching him closely I thought was just a fantastic left back fantastic partial of the ball and and so many of them were and ended up making the Champions League and the Europa Cup for you know every season that we were there. So it was just the most wonderful experience for us. Oh yeah, I bet. I mean, as a as a fan, it was a, a great time. I'm sure, yeah, literally being on the coaching staff, it must have been great. But um, despite the really good years um, at Spurs at the end of the twenty well 2011 2012 season, where Spurs actually around January were looking like a title challenge was looking realistic. Obviously, we'd finished fourth and then through that ridiculous thing where yeah. Chelsea winning the Champions League, which Kai Tell yeah. remembers that more fondly than I do. I was very upset that night. But um, ultimately, it, Harry would um, be relieved of his duties. Um, and I suppose you would leave with him as would, as would yeah. Joe Jordan. But um, looking back on that, um, do you think that you and Harry and the, the rest of the coaching staff should have been given the chance to come back and kind of give it another go to get in the Champions League. How how were you, did you all feel at the time when um, when that decision was made? Yeah, I, de definitely. I, I mean, I I knew it would. I knew that it would happen on the on when Chelsea won the Champions League. We all know. We all knew pretty much what was at stake in that game. We sort of read between the lines. I knew that. Do I think Harry deserved? Um, the opportunity to carry on 100% do. I think the problem probably was is that, as you rightly said, we were flying high just after Christmas and was numerous points ahead of Arsenal and then they ended up catching us. And we're, so, uh, you know, if we'd have finished third, and I think that third and fourth spot went down the last game of the very last game of the season. So I think that's probably what done us in really. And, you know, we, we, we maybe should have finished third and we didn't finish third. And, on any other season, finishing fourth would have been enough, but it wasn't on that season. And so the area, unfortunately, paid the you know paid the price as as we all did. Do I think it was unfair? Of course, of course I do. Do I, you know, when you look back at what's happened to Tottenham ever since then, um, you know, I, it's easy with hindsight, but you know, I, I'm not sure that anyone has done or would have done any better than Harry as being the manager. He he. I thought he did a wonderful job at the club and galvanised them. And um, so, I, you know, I, 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 and we, we just get over it. It's football, you know what it's like. But, uh, yeah, we was hugely disappointed. Yeah, not the, not the first time, I guess, Levy's made a sort of unpopular decision when it comes to relieving a manager of his duties, obviously with Pochettino. And you've seen how on set, you know, both occasions it's sort of, backfired in the in the short term and we'll we'll see how it works out for Spurs I guess I've got my fingers crossed that yeah it won't be the last time as an Arsenal fan that that Levy makes a questionable decision <laughs> like that but um on to on to your management career we were talking about coaching mostly up until now and I guess we'll actually have to take we'll be going back in time because the, the Bournemouth role did happen be before Spurs but Stafford Rangers aside that Bournemouth um, managerial yeah. job was kind of your, your first big um role as the the main man in the dugout as the manager so what was the transition from coach to assistant manager to to manager like and did you sort of have people that you would sound things off of around you like Harry who's obviously been in that position as manager like your dad who who would have been in the position yeah. as well um how was that transition for you yeah well obviously I had all of these people um to lean on Harry was living in Bournemouth and knew the club really well and um 
but, but in truth, um, as prepared as I thought I was, having assisted Ari for a while and, you know, been quite a while on the coaching side, as, as ready as I thought I was, I, in truth, for me, nothing really prepares you for management. It is, it is a million miles away from being a coach. The responsibility and the, is, is so, so different. And it was, I must admit, I found it really, really difficult. I mean, we, uh, the, the club was in financial trouble and they were heading in the wrong direction, which is why the changes are made. And, it, you know, it's usually why the changes are made at football club. So I was taking a difficult situation um, and we ended up, you know, staying in the league because they was in trouble of not staying in the league. The following season, we didn't start well. And then we had a points deduction because they went, the club went into administration, so we had 10 points deduction. And and it, then it became really difficult because you just couldn't see any way out. We had lots of games to play, lots of games to play. Um, and you know, I think the only way we sort of tackled it between us, the group of players and the staff, was to say that, if we can make sure that, because we've got a 10-point deduction, if we can make sure that we don't get relegated by more than 10 points, then we could hold our heads up by saying um, that had it not been for administration, which was nothing to do with the players or the staff, then in fact we would have stayed up. So that was our goal, really, to try and to try and not go down by, by less than 10 points, if that makes sense. And in the event, I think we... I think we went down by one point on the last game of the season. So we really recouped all of those. So um, it was it was an achievement, but not really because we end up getting relegated. So it didn't mean anything. But had we have stayed up, had we have got, which amounted to a result of Carlisle who were in the playoff spots on the last game of the season where we drew and other results didn't go for us. Otherwise, a draw would have been enough. But we needed to win because of the other results and we didn't. It would, for me, be the biggest achievement that I've had in my entire football career, bar none. But it wasn't to be. We didn't actually quite do it. But we, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we give a really good account of ourselves. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is it was a really, really difficult period. And I was very young in the job. And although I'd been in football all my life, nothing really prepares you for management. It is a different kettle of fish altogether. So um, and that was a, a really difficult introduction into management and of course then they had new owners and within three games of the following season I'd gone so um, it, were, it was hard um, but a big learning curve for me. It sounds very much like that and very much a football cliche case of you know so close but yet so far um, with, yeah. the, the, with the, the other whole relegation promotion thing but um, a slightly different job I guess you took on a bit more recently um, you're, we Kaito mentioned earlier you played in America um, back in your playing career, but you actually went over to, to Hong Kong. Two separate spells, I believe, at Hong yeah. Kong Pegasus, now I think TSW Pegasus. Um, yeah. Given, obviously, that Hong Kong isn't a, league, isn't a country known for football, yeah. particularly, um, how did the experience of sort of coaching a team out there match up to your expectations before... You um you turned up was the was were the players better were they worse what was it a, yeah just tell me a bit about that experience it, <clears throat> well it, it started when we was um, actually when we was at Spurs we did a we had a pre season tour to China and Hong Kong so we played a couple of games in Hong Kong and um got got to meet the guy who owned the team who we played against when we was at Spurs and I got I got a phone call actually when I, I wasn't working at the time I was in between jobs I got a phone call to ask me if I wanted to do a presentation to the sort of like, I think like the Hong Kong FA and the younger coaches, if I wanted to go over there and do a presentation for them on football and how things are done in England, which I was happy to do. And while I, <clears throat> while I was out there, he said to me, would you like to take my team for the rest of the season? Which is what I did. I, I, I think I went back home and then flew back out again and, and stayed there from sort of Christmas till the end of the year. I absolutely loved it. It's you know, as you know, there's lots of English speaking people in, so it makes it easier for you. Very clean place, very vibrant place, extremely safe place. Looked after me tremendously well. The football would be, apart from a couple of the teams who would be Division One, the other teams would be maybe National League standard, but they were all very professional, trained every day, 
So apart from being halfway around the world, it was football and I got up in the morning, take the training, prepare the team. So it's very much the same. You know, it wasn't, it's not, don't, you can't confuse Hong Kong with China. China's, you know, financially and everything different ball game altogether. But I had two spells out there, absolutely loved it. We did quite well, which was nice also. I was really pleased for the owner of the club that I was able to go out there and do okay for him. So I loved it. My, my wife and I, wife came with me on both times and it was a really, really fabulous experience. One, one I wouldn't want to, um, wouldn't want to change. It's kind of fascinating how you mentioned the experience sort of stemming from uh, pre-season originally. And it's kind of it's kind of nice that it kind of came full circle. The pre-season sort of ideas, you know, you make these foreign tours and um, I guess sort of dip your toes into their culture and sort of bring the football yeah. to them. But then you, you've ended up moving over there and experiencing um, their culture even more in depth and sort of experiencing their football culture on top of that, um, which is, yeah. again, not not many. Um, managers or players from within the English game have kind of had those experience. So I think it's pretty cool. But after um, Hong Kong, you would, uh, you would manage South End. And I think you'd actually um, manage one of our former guests, Simon Cox, uh, during his, his time there. Yeah. Um, and since then, obviously, um, we were talking about it before we, before we started recording, but you're, um, you're working at Bristol Rovers now. Um, you're, you're a first team coach. So how did that opportunity come about? And uh, how are you enjoying that experience so far? I think um, Joey, Joey Barton, who's the manager of Bristol Rovers, is, is a guy who I know very well. He was a player at QPR when Harry and I was at uh, QPR. Um, and we always used to have, um, you know, Harry, uh, uh, Joey is mad keen on his, you know, mad keen on his football. He's really into it, really was in his playing days, really into systems, who does well and he was a was a a great follower of the foreign teams and how they go about it, Atletico Madrid and people like that. Yeah. So we used to always have conversations when I was a coach and he was a player about systems of play and how he, how he saw it and what have you. And we always got on very well. Um, and obviously I've sort of followed him. He'd been to Burnley, then he went up the Rangers and he did a really good job at Fleetwood town. Um, and then he got the job at Bristol Rovers and um, I, I, I would have sent him a, good luck message when he got the job. I mean, I don't ring him every day or anything like that, but I, I think he lost one of his coaches about six weeks ago. He, one of his coaches, for whatever reason, um, couldn't continue and he was short. He, uh, I'm relatively local, as we've sport, spoken about. And I think the, himself, although Joe has been managing now for two or three years, he's not that vastly experienced. And I think his staff are not, although they are all really good, enthusiastic and, and are very good. And I mean, I mean that very good. Um, they're not experienced either. And I, and I just thought that he maybe rung me and said, how do you feel about coming down here and um, seeing what you think and lending a hand, being part of the group, which I was delighted. And I, I know, I know the club from, from years and years ago. It's a great footballing city, a lovely city a big club, uh, the two Bristol clubs are big clubs with big potential. And I suppose that the last thing was the owner of the club is a guy who's involved with the Jordanian national team set up, which is a, um, which is a job that Harry took maybe five years ago. They were trying to qualify for the World Cup and gave Harry the job for three matches um, and I went along there with him and it was a brilliant experience taking a national team. We played um, a couple of matches out there and, and travelled down to Australia. And so the owner was part of the setup in Jordan. We got to meet him and know him, a really, really lovely man. Uh, and he is the owner of um, Bristol Rovers. So when Joey asked me and I had the opportunity, I knew I'd be working for good people. Again, it's kind of reassuring because you mentioned earlier um having having to have the thick skin that sort of quote from the uh, manchester city yep. person and uh, it's good to know that you've had these relationships that have sort of sustained you throughout like like harry there's always people sort of within the footballing world who who are there are good people sort of giving back you mentioned the connection between um jordan and, and bristol rovers and stuff so there's sort of these occasionally yeah sort of connections that you've made that have, that have worked out in the long term eventually um i guess on a on a personal note um, in terms of your aspirations, you're at Bristol Rovers now with Joey, who actually, like yourself, is kind of a pretty cultured person within football. And he's, he's gone over to France. I think he even went up to, to Scotland. So he's had those kind of yeah. technically, I guess, with Scotland abroad uh, experiences. But 
looking not too far ahead because you've got a job to do at Bristol, but do you have ambition of being a manager again? Is coaching sort of more where you're thinking of sticking um, for the foreseeable future? I enjoy being on the training ground. I, do, um, I must say I enjoy, I jo- enjoy doing that. I enjoy contributing to the cause of a football club. Uh, I enjoy being a manager. I, the couple of experience I had was extremely difficult. Another experience it was wonderful. That is a very traumatic job, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't shy away from it. Having said that, I love the job I do now, supporting, um, supporting somebody else. Um, there's nothing like it, getting out every day, contributing, getting taking the players' training, trying to find a way of winning a match on a Saturday. Uh, you know, I, I haven't got to be in charge. I haven't got to be anything. I, I, as long as I'm helping and contributing... And quite where it takes me or where, we, you know, I'm still driven. I'm still very ambitious. I'd like to take Bristol Rovers to higher places. I'd like to be in higher places myself. But, you know, I'm old enough to know that, you know, we need we need to win Saturday's match. That's the only thing that's important. We need to win Saturday's match. So I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing. It's enough for me right now. Um, I'm not looking to change it. I don't know what the future holds. I don't think yeah, anyone really does. I, but I, but I still, all I can say is I still want to do well and still look forward to getting up very early in the morning, driving my car to work. Yeah, you have got to keep going, keep stopping off at Starbucks, keep that routine <laughs> going. But um, yeah, no, I hope 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 all goes well at Bristol Rovers. My my family allegiances are a bit more with the red side of the city, but still, oh, you're but, yeah, yeah, be, best of luck with that. But. Um, that does kind of bring us to the end of today's podcast. So I um, just want to thank my co-host Kaitel first, as always, and then a massive thank you to our guest Kevin. And um, really appreciate you coming on. And normally at this point, we'd um, we'd say if our guests have social media accounts, they could sort of promote it. But do, do you have social media accounts, Kevin? No, I I, I don't. As um, I think I, I think having having been in. At football clubs and chartered. I haven't got a very thick skin. I think I, I think it, I, I ventured over to Twitter and had a look at what they've said on the back of the <laughs> feet, and I'm not. It's not for me. It's not for me. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Well, everyone, hopefully, if you you've enjoyed this, um, keep you can keep an eye on Kevin's um his all the comings and goings at Bristol Rovers at the moment. But yeah, thank thank you so much, Kevin. I'll, I'll pass over to Kai now just to to end things. Yeah, don't really blame you, Kevin, on the social media front. It can be like a like a prison yard out there at times, not the most sort of <laughs> inviting environment necessarily. But a massive thanks again, yeah, from both of us to to Kevin and and good luck to you at Bristol Rovers and in and, and everything else that you're that you've gotten up to these days. Um, as far as our listeners and viewers, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please do give us a follow, a like, or a subscribe, or whatever you prefer to check out the podcast. You can find us on your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Just look for United Mates Football Podcast. Same goes for if you're looking for our YouTube channel as well. That way you can sort of put some faces to these voices. Across social media, we're at United Mates FP on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And then check out our website, www.unitedmatesfp.com for all the above content and a few fun articles from the team here as well. Until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.